This is Slow Food Live. My name is Giselle. Slow Food Live is a project of Slow Food USA. If you are not familiar with Slow Food USA, I definitely encourage you to jump onto our website, slowfoodusa.org, and learn more about who we are and what we do. Um, to put it very, very simply, we are an international nonprofit that advocates and works towards good, clean, and fair food for all. Of course, that means many, many things across, the, across food systems and landscapes, whether it's fish or meat or small farms or restaurants or markets. So we on Slow Food Live are excited and have for the last year been just leaning into different topic areas and bringing really wonderful people on to share a little bit of what they do and why and how and why it's important to you. So today I'm really excited to have the five of you. For the last few weeks, we've had a, um, a sort of complimentary campaign for our Plant a Seed campaign. Plant a Seed is a campaign we do every spring and we sell a little kit of five seed packets, um, most of which are varieties from the Ark of Taste for your garden or your farm or your friends or your mom or whatever you like. So the idea behind that is to increase biodiversity and expose these sort of rare varieties to folks who are adept at growing so we can get more biodiverse <clears throat> vegetables into your garden. Biodiversity is a sort of key value for slow food. Um, and of course, earth friendly farming practices is another. So the five folks we have on today are all working in, you know, slightly different spaces in the sort of farming, CSA, agriculture, policy, and coalition building, farm support, that sort of thing in the sort of different corners of, of this world. And so I am going to ask each of them to tell you a little bit more about themselves and what they do and where they are um, from, from where they are. So I'm going to go ahead and hop over and start with you, Jarrett. You're in New York and Jarrett and Trixie are both at Glenwood. So if you can let us know a little bit more about you um, and where you are and what you do. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm Jarrett Nelson. And I work at the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming in Cold Spring, New York just uh, an hour or so north of New York City. Uh, I'm a farm manager and the vegetable farmer at Glenwood. I've been farming for uh, a little over 10 years and a lot of that has actually been here at Glenwood. Um, and I've been part of a CSA farms my entire farming career. Uh, we have 150 to 200 members here just serving our local community. We only have uh, on-farm pickup, no, no drop-off sites. Um, and uh, as part of Glenwood's work in the region, we also have launched a Hudson Valley CSA coalition. Um, so there's almost 100 farms in the Hudson Valley that are a part of that, um, helping to spread and promote CSA in, in the Hudson Valley region. Thanks, Jarrett. Trixie, do you want to introduce yourself since you're in the same spot? Sure. My name is Trixie Wessel. I'm the sales and outreach manager here at Glenwood. Um, I've been on and around farms my whole life, growing up mostly around conventional dairy, um, diversified with small scale produce. Um, I have a master's degree in food and agriculture law and policy from Vermont Law School. Uh, and prior to coming to Glenwood, I worked in midsize organic produce, managing about a 1500 member CSA and small scale dairy, um, including an on site creamery. Um, my role here at Glenwood deals mostly with promoting our farm products, um, our own meat, as well as our own organic produce, and working a lot with uh, local donation partners to get food into their hands and help, uh, help increase food sovereignty in the region. Excellent. Thanks, Trixie. And Kat, I'm going to pop over to you. Kat's in Wisconsin. You are a farmer. Yeah. So my name is Kat Becker. I own Cattail Organics, which is located in north central Wisconsin. Um, we're kind of like similar to northern Maine in terms of where we're located in uh, latitude. Um, for uh, gardeners out there, I like to brag that we're on the zone three, zone four border. So we're very cold, but we still run on probably a very similar CSA calendar to those folks in the Hudson Valley who must be in like zone seven or eight or even zone seven. That's like, Six. you are. Six, okay, that makes me feel better a little bit. 
I made a zone eight joke once and someone was like, I'm in zone nine. I'm like, oh, I see you're really operating in a warmer climate than me. Um, so I have about a 90 box a week, three season CSA that runs May through Thanksgiving. Um, I also work extensively with small scale wholesale restaurants and grocery stores, uh, three sc school districts, two of them rural, one urban in our area. Um, and then we also do and have been setting up a food bank CSA program. Um, we're collaborating with Fair Share CSA Coalition. So Tess is on from Fair Share and some other farms in our area to provide basically $20 a week food share boxes, um, mirroring what USDA put together for COVID, but with local food. So um, that's kind of what I do. And I'm happy to talk more about CSA, but both at my current farm and my old farm, which was just down the road um, over the last 15 years, I've always been a CA farmer. And I feel like CSA is a great backbone, but not the only component for the local food system. Um, so there I am. Excellent. Thank you, Kat. I'm going to jump over to you, Tess, since you have a connection to Cattail there um, to introduce yourself. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Tess Romanski. I'm the communications coordinator at Fair Share CSA Coalition. Um, it's based in Madison, Wisconsin, but we have a regional focus um, to support and connect farmers and eaters through CSA. And so we do that through helping consumers find local organic CSA through our online farm search tool um, and also helping provide financial assistance for lower income households to be able to purchase those CSAs because there's a, a high price point to buy into a CSA and so helping make it a little bit more equitable with access. Um, I also have my master's from Vermont Law School in Food and Ag Law and Policy. So we have a, a good alumni connection that we, we missed on the, the pre-call. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to, to talk more about how um, CSA helps co connect communities and farmers together to get you know, good local organic food to everyone. Thank you, Tess. And Evan, over to you. All right, uh, my name is Evan Wig, and I am out here in, if you believe it, uh, somewhere between zone nine and zone 10. Um, I'm in Santa Rosa, California. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, what you just mentioned there, Tess, um, about uh, making CSAs accessible, because I think that's how I got uh, started in this whole uh, world, was, was living in, in uh, New York City in a tiny little apartment in Brooklyn um, and, and got uh, hooked on to CSA because there was a subsidized CSA pay what you can kind of program that was uh, funded by a local organization. And so um, I was able to buy into that, uh, got hooked, got curious, started asking questions. Next thing I know, it was gardening. Then uh, uh, eventually quit my job, moved out to a, a, a ranch here in California and started farming. Uh, now I work with Community Alliance of Family Farmers. We're a nonprofit organization that um, does uh, education, outreach, and uh, political organizing for family farms across the state. Um, and uh, we do, we've do we been advocating for CSA policy and um, assistance for over 40 years. And it's uh, great to be here uh, amongst our CSA champions across the country. Excellent. Thank you all so much. One thing I would love to hear from you attendees out there is, do you know what a CSA is? Do you, have, do you get a CSA? Have you been getting one for 20 years? What's your sort of level of CSA familiarity or um, are you part of one? Um, then we can kind of talk about it from there. One thing I want to ask you five is that you, whether down the road or in a different state entirely, you have moved place a few times or maybe one time or many times. And of course, farming is a very place-based practice um, and very much integrated with the community in the place that you're at. So I'm kind of curious how you ended up where you are and what effect your own place and community has on your work and how you approach that work and approach the community around you. And any of you can just jump on in. <laughs> there you go, Kat. <laughs> I'm, I'm naturally loud, so I'm just gonna take that role. Um, so I, I mean, this is an issue that I consistently talk about. So I am, while my accent is mostly gone, because I've been in the upper Midwest for 20 years. I'm from New York City um, and uh, definitely did not have a farm background in any way, shape or form um, and came to agriculture through policy and um, ended up in Madison for graduate school. And I worked on farms along my journey. Um, 
but I live in a very rural part of um, North Central Wisconsin, com especially compared to the density of like people in um, the East Coast, uh, not just New York City, but even like the Hudson Valley in terms of the density of what you would see there. Um, and I was at a different farm, which is only a mile down the road from my farm for 12 years and then got divorced and then restarted my farm career like literally a mile up the road because my New York mom had moved here and my children um, are shared with my ex-husband. So it was a practical, while well, slightly manic decision. Um, but I, a lot of people actually asked me if I was gonna move when I left my other farm. Um, and, and this place has become really important to me. It's where I've learned to farm. It's the community connections I've made. Um, a lot of my mourning and leaving my other farm was about the land and the place and um, the connection. And I think um, it's, I think that there is often, especially in the US context, this romantic, like my family's been on the farm for five generation thing. Um, which is rooted in this like pretty problematic colonialist, like we stole the land and now it's ours viewpoint. And so I think being part of community and being part of the place you're in and understanding the ecology and you know, my children have always been of this place and those are really beautiful things. Um, but I think that often people, especially white people <laughs> take it a little far in terms of um, how much place matters um, and how much you can claim place as your own. And so there are these really beautiful things. Um, and I'm really deeply connected to my community and the schools and all of those relationships. And those things really matter. But in terms of like my own lifetime and my children's lifetime, I think it's important not to over romanticize the idea that you somehow be, belong to a place and then you have some sort of ownership stake that's more important than it would be if you moved somewhere. Um, so there's my big critique. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, that makes me curious about, you know, the the difference in rural and urban. So, Evan, you're you're working in Santa Rosa, which is, you know, not a major city, but obviously very close to one. And Trixie and Jarrett, you guys are in New York. And um, I, Kat, I really appreciate that perspective about ownership. And then on the other end of that, I think is sort of responsibility. Like, what is your responsibility? I, in my own experience with farming here, I feel like there's farmers are asked a lot. Uh, can we have free produce? Can you show up? Can you give us tours? Like that, there's sort of this perceived responsibility to the local community. And like, at what level do you feel that? And and how does it shift and change when you go between rural and urban? And maybe Evan, you can speak to that. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think I think that. A CSA, one of the beautiful things about a CSA is I think it, it connects you um, to your food shed and, and gives you a, a greater, more diverse sense of space. Um, as I mentioned in my little intro, you know, I, I got my first CSA living in, in Brooklyn. And so, um, you know, when, when I joined the CSA and heard that there was a, uh, you know, a, a farm that was, uh, that I was getting my food from a farm that was a little further upstate, I thought, what, like the Bronx, right? Like, I, I couldn't quite understand. I, I never left the city. I was so uh, such an urban person. I didn't even have a car. I rode my bicycle everywhere. And so I, I didn't even understand and have a conception of the rest of, of the state, what the uh, rural communities were all about. And so joining that CSA gave me a really strong connection because I was continually finding what was coming off the field, even if I didn't have it in the concrete jungle of, of my neighborhood. And I think that's uh, something that CSA really does is has you more in tune, especially if you're not in agriculture, if you're not continually working um, with nature in a direct way to, to produce and you're not dealing with that. I mean, you're in an air conditioned or, or heated space every day. You, you don't really have a, a connection to that. But um, a couple of days ago here in, in, uh, in my county, we just got declared a drought. And the funny thing about that is that for, for most people living in a, in a drought in an urban environment, it doesn't really affect them, right? It's uh, the water still comes out of the faucet, um, but obviously it does matter for farmers and ranchers. And so being a part of a CSA is part of a community where the drought really does directly impact you. You can see it, you can hear it from the farmer. And so I think it just brings you more in tune with what's happening in your food shed and, and builds that bridge to, to recognize that uh, it's not just about what's happening in the city, it's about what's happening in that uh, urban rural interface that uh, allows for our communities to to exist in the first place so i think it just gets us outside of our 
little urban bubbles um, and vice versa gets farmers talking to folks in the city. And, and I think that exchange is so important, especially these days when there's obviously huge uh, divides uh, socially and politically between urban and, and rural America. Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, that connection between farmers and eaters. And I think that Jared and Trixie and Tess, I'd love to hear from you because learning more about what you do, I think in a lot of ways, your community is other farmers or other livestock, you know, managers, like people who are doing the work that you're doing, or Tess, in your case, you, your community is people whose CSAs you're able to make accessible to the larger community. And what I what I want to ask is how is it how is it helpful that you you can sort of be that connection between the community and the farmers without asking the farmers to sort of like constantly be available to the community? Or is that the case at all really? <laughs> um, and and how do you sort of protect your community of skilled laborers and then your community of consumers and eaters and supporters? or connect the two. Yeah, I'd love to jump in here. Um, so originally coming from very rural, very far northern New York, um, I usually describe it to folks who aren't familiar with the area as closer to Canada than our own state capital, which is factual. Um, and that area was very, I don't want to say it was saturated with farmers, but we had a lot of folks who had been in farming for a long time, particularly in small scale conventional dairy. And unfortunately I watched a lot of those farms close. So it was very interesting growing up surrounded by farmers, surrounded by um, agway and mills and in a farming community essentially. And then having moved to progressively more urban environments and still being involved in agriculture. And especially my role at most of the farms that I've worked at has been sort of that go between between the public and the farm itself, because the farmer, like in this case, Jarrett is too busy out in the field actually growing the crops. I don't have the patience or the skills for that, but I know how to talk about farming and I love getting folks involved with their farm and where their food comes from. Um, so it's interesting to hear from people who have learned about farming and then since gotten involved in the industry through a CSA or through a farmer's market or through that first connection with the farm. I'm always curious to hear how that happened and what inspired them so much to then become not only a consistent CSA uh, member or a, or a consistent customer, but to actually begin working in the industry. Um, so that's definitely the kind of connection that we're hoping to foster between farms and community is getting folks so involved that they not only stick with us, but that they go that extra mile and either learn about the industry or maybe get further involved. Awesome, thanks Trixie. So on that note, um, first I wanna say just in case this is helpful to anybody out there. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Generally what it is, is you, you pay a price at the beginning of the season and then every week or every two weeks or whatever the setup is, you get a box of produce. Um, you are not deciding what produce goes into your box, you get a box <laughs> of what produce is fresh and available that week from the farm, generally speaking. I know that some CSAs do give people that option. Um, so, you know, it, can we talk a little bit about why CSAs are good for farms? And also, Kat, to your point, why it's not the only thing. You know, how else can a community member, like you're mentioning, Trixie, engage with a local farm? What is helpful and supportive to the farm? And then how does it benefit me as a community member and individual? Like what, you know, I, to me, I'm like, I'm getting gorgeous produce that's very healthy. And my first CSA box, I think, launched me into being like the cook that I am now because I had to figure it out. <laughs> so it was like a fun and creative endeavor, but also I felt really great knowing that the produce I was getting was good for me, um, was being grown in a way that I can get behind. So can we talk a little bit about why, C you know, what is a CSA? How does it work? Why is it good for a farm? You know, why does the Fair Share CSA Coalition exist? Um, why is it so instrumental to the farms in your network? And how else can a community member engage with a farm that is supportive um, of that farm sort of sustaining and thriving? Can I take it for yes, to please. start off? Great. Um, so looping back a little bit to Evan's point before, I think getting a CSA really invests you in a community around that farm. So when you're getting a CSA share, you're investing that upfront cost into your farm. And so you're really 
you care about the farm, you care that it succeeds because you get something from it, but you're also giving something to the farm. So it's really kind of a symbiotic relationship between the farmer and the eater. And then the other people in the CSA community who are buying a CSA from that farm. So you're really, it's really an integrated relationship between farmer and eater when you're getting a CSA. Um, it's also local farms are local businesses. And so you hear this statistic of 70 cents of every dollar you spend locally stays in your community as opposed to 40 cents. That 70 cents stays in your community when you're buying from a local farmer. So it's not just that you're getting food from your farmer and you're supporting your farmer, but you're supporting your community by supporting a, a local business in your area. May I follow up with just a concept, which I know, so, you know, in the upper Midwest, so also folks should know that CSA looks really different in different places. Um, and um, the ways that it has kind of evolved in the US context has been really different. Um, so the upper Midwest has been this very like family farm based or individual farm based model. The East Coast has a range. Um, I have no idea what CSA actually looks like in California. So I'm not even going to try to talk about that. Um, so it does look different in different places, but the core value is not just investing in a farm, but it's this concept, at least from my standpoint, of shared risk and shared reward. And that has always been like what has defined the CSA movement. And the idea is that you're not just investing upfront, because quite honestly, for us, Fair Share CSA Coalition, for let's say folks that are using food share or EBT, it has food stamps, um, that's processed monthly. So Fair Share as an organization is actually absorbing my risk associated with that as an organization that I'm a member of. So it's not always about the, the full risk of financially or the full investment financially, but it's the idea that you're joined with this farm for at least a season, hopefully many seasons, and that you come to understand and choose a farm that aligns with your values. So there's different farms with different values. Um, in the upper Midwest, people often think about local organic farms as this progressive force. There's a lot of extremely politically and um, social justice uh, <laughs> ignoring conservative CSA farms. So there's nothing about that that, that places you in a certain part in the, of the political spectrum, for instance. Um, but you know, that idea of risk is, is really central and then you're joining in. And again, I think the idea that um, you don't have choice, I don't actually know what Glenwood looks like, but far, a lot of farms that have on-farm pickup do have an, an aspect of choice. We have some choice. Um, people can opt out of vegetables for the whole season on our farm because that's one of the most problematic parts of CSA, quite honestly. Um, and we're very clear about expectations. So for anyone that's thinking about joining a CSA, interview your farmers, ask what they offer, ask what boxes look like last year, ask to talk to former members, choose a farm that fits your values. Like every farm is not the same. Every CSA is not the same. There are some farms where you're going to get two or three items. There are farms where you're going to get a huge amount of produce. Um, and so there's nothing uniform other than that shared risk and shared reward um, and often an upfront investment that defines CSA, at least in my standpoint. Yeah, yeah, I really agree with uh, a lot of what you just said, Kat. Um, I feel like as a farmer, there's just so much uncertainty that we deal with, um, most, you know, from the weather. Um, but also right now I have all these like shipping delays of supplies. Um, you never kind of kind of know what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, not just CSA members, you know, are sharing some of that financial burden with you, but also just, you know, at the beginning of the season, knowing that all of your produce is already sold um, and that you don't not have to scramble and call distributors um, all year. Um, it's just, I think, a uh, really helpful piece of mind. It allows you to actually just like focus on growing. Um, but also I, I find, that I think, you know, since we're, you know, close to New York City and there's just like such a disconnect with where food comes from and how it, like how it grows. Um, and I think people just like see it, it just like appears on your grocery store shelves. Um, and just the idea that like it is uh, difficult and fickle and un uncertain. Um, I think it's actually like a useful uh, <laughs> thing for people to connect to and feel more of a connection and understanding of where their foods food comes from. Um, and, and we do have our, our, our farm also has a pick your own component. Um, 
and especially for I find for children to just like uh, they just get really excited about you know picking some cherry tomatoes or or some flowers and you know or just seeing what like a carrot looks like in the ground instead of um, on a plate. Um, and I yeah, so I think I think CSA can do a lot just to also address some of this like very large disconnect between um, you know where many people live in urban and suburban areas and you know where food actually comes from and like what it takes to produce it. Thanks, Jared. I think this is a, a great point and segue into the, the thing about CSAs and farms is that it exposes folks to the regionality and seasonality of your food. So like cat might not be growing the same things that Jared, you're growing because you are in different places in different zones, like, and, and, you know, every farm is going to have different strengths. What was really striking to me all those years ago in that first CSA, or the first one I got from a single farm, is how many different things they had. So throughout the season, I was getting just so many different things. And so then I started to understand like, oh, and I live in a orchard land. So there's lots of swaths of land with one type of tree. Um, in order for you to operate a CSA, you need to have a diversified farm. And so I think people are, it's a wonderful way to expose people to the difference between a farm that grows one thing and a farm that grows many things. Um, so I'd love to hear from you about like, three things, I mean, three fold question. One is, you know, how do you decide what you put in the ground and what you want to grow? And why is it important to you to grow a variety of things? And, you know, Jarrett and Trixie and Evan, how do you decide what programs, especially at Glenwood, you have many different programs. Like how did you decide which programs to run um, and how much of that was based on how you would engage the community? And then I can just refresh these questions in a few minutes, but then Evan, I want to jump over to you and also ask how does, this exposure, regional, you know, regional strengths, regional products, seasonality, all of that, how does that play into policy and how we can sort of showcase some of the policy changes we need to make to support these diversified, you know, sort of earth friendly practices in the face of, you know, a pretty large scale system that is doing something very different. So We'll go to the first question, which is like, why is it important to have diversified pro products and programs? And why did you decide to do that or sort of how? So Jarrett, you're unmuted. And if you wanna jump in, I encourage you to do so. Otherwise just jump on in. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, well, um, it is a little more difficult to uh, be very diversified. So we I think we're growing 55 different crops here. Um, but in terms of, you know, the health of the soil and uh, ecological diversity and, you know, just the health of the land, um, having a lot more diversity is, you know, a lot more, you know, closer to, a little bit closer to a more natural state and compared to the amount of sort of monocropping that happens in conventional farming, um, I think we have like a lot fewer pests and disease issues without having to actually, um, do anything because we're just not growing the same thing in the same land year after year. Um, and our soil is not getting as uh, depleted in the same way. So, you know, lettuce uses different nutrients than tomatoes. And so we have um, a five, about a five year rotation here. Um, so nothing is really planted in the same place, um, you know, with, until like five years, five years later. So it really gives time for the ecology and the soil to recover um, in between crops um, and just as, you know, generally more sustainable way to farm, I think. Evan, could you, or Kat, jump on in, please. I'll be fast. <laughs> yes. So we, we grow a similar mix of um, crops, um, probably, um, but there are some things that we actually don't grow. So we're in North Central Wisconsin. Every other farmer in the country can be jealous that kohlrabi is a staple vegetable in Marathon County. So I could sell infinite kohlrabi. Um, people love it. Kohlrabi is king. Um, 
And that's like a vegetable in other places that people have never seen before, often hate because it's basically like a swollen broccoli stem, which who likes that? And um, have to convince people that this is a reasonable crop. And so there are regional preferences. We also grow nothing spicy other than like a couple of hot peppers, because again, people, most folks in North Central Wisconsin don't eat spicy food. Um, like even black pepper is kind of like on the sidelines. Um, and so we do expose, I mean, for CSA, that diversity, the ecological diversity, the rotation, the risk, all of those things are reasons to have diversity as a farm. Um, but there are crops that I've gotten rid of because quite frankly, nobody likes them. And I don't want my CSA members to be alienated. And so we walk the line between introducing people to new vegetables, like hawker eye turnips, which are sweet spring turnips, which everyone loves and are not um, that common. Um, but we don't plant spicy mustard green. There's no spicy, basically anything on my farm. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of farms are based in their region and who they're serving and grow food for those folks. Um, and, and there is that balance with CSA around having a diverse number of things for the season and um, also extending the season. You know, one of, that's one of the best things about being a CSA farmer, at least from my standpoint, is that there's this challenge, this ultimate challenge of trying to have vegetables. Um, you know, we have vegetables for 12 months of the year. And so how do we do that? And that's a lot of, it's a lot of skills and storage and unique crop mixes and season extension. And, and that's also part, from a farmer standpoint, one of the most fun, challenging things about growing a diversity. We also don't grow eggplant, which is because people here also hate eggplant. And so we grow it in our family garden, but it is, it is by far the most hated vegetable. Um, people also don't like celery. So, you know, those are things that we have to keep in mind for where we live. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. I think that's really important. Like walking that line is really important. So you need to know your people as much as you're suggesting they ought to know you before they jump into a CSA. I think that's a great, you know, you have your favorite brewery based on their lineup of beers that aligns with like the kind of beer you like to drink. It's really not any different. <laughs> um, I've been part of more than one CSA here and it's really a different fleet of vegetables, uh, the kind of things, you know, one super heavy on the mustard greens. <laughs> that sort of thing. So I love that. Um, and Evan and Tess, you're both really have to be close to the community, I think, to know, like Kat is mentioning, what they're looking for, what they want, and what they might respond to well. Um, Evan, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. And then also this question of how does that roll into policy and the systemic changes that will benefit everyone? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as, as you heard from the last couple speakers, diversity is foundational to any healthy living system, right? Um, it's, it's healthy in a mix of crops, as you heard about, you know, Jarrett was talking about crop rotations and, and keeping the, the soil health um, available through shifting uh, crops from, from one to another. Some are uh, nitrogen feeders, some are nitrogen fixers, moving those crops around as opposed to uh, just a constant monocropping system. And, um, you know, the same thing goes for any, any living system. You, you look in a forest, you look in a, in a natural landscape and uh, diversity of wildlife creates a, a healthy ecosystem. Same thing goes for an economy, uh, a community with a number of different businesses, a number of different people in that, um, in that sphere are going to provide a healthier uh, space for folks as opposed to a, a single company uh, dominating a single town, a company town. That's not a, it's not a healthy, vibrant, uh, e uh, e uh, economy, right? And so we recognize this. I think CSAs recognize this. The small farm community of, of diversified farms recognize this. The challenge is that most government agencies do not. And so when you look at most government programs through, say, for instance, the USDA, they're thinking about agriculture in terms of massive monocrops, because unfortunately, that's the way that agriculture has gone over the last 50 years, is um, bigger farms, fewer crops, um, and so one good example of that is when we had uh, the pandemic, um, we had uh, government assistance going towards farms and towards agriculture that had disrupted markets um, all over the place. And the way those programs were set up, just like all programs, <laughs> most programs at, at the USDA, is they're designed with what the USDA considers a farm, which is 1,000 acres, 5,000 acres of the same crop of you know, 5,000 acres of soy, 5,000 acres um, of corn. 
And so when you fill out, when, when you have that form to sign up for pandemic relief, or you have that ability to, to uh, sell into the emergency food program, the farm to uh, the, the farm to family program, for instance, they're all designed for these massive farms. And so simply signing up for crop insurance through the USDA, these government subsidized programs, um, they're not designed for a two acre farm growing 50 different crops. That's unthinkable in, in the offices of the USDA. And so unfortunately what that leads to is uh, a bias and uh, more resources going to bigger farms and actually incentivizing um, that consolidation, incentivizing monocropping. And so what we do from an advocacy perspective, both uh, at a statewide level here through CAF, but also through our national coalition, the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, is to promote policies that uh, make it easier for smaller farms to sign up for government aid or to, to, to buy into these programs or to um, get the kind of assistance and actually have government programs that encourage farmers to grow more crops um, on fewer acres. Um, now, we still have a long, long ways to go, um, but there are programs and, and opportunities for um, both farmers as well as just general consumer advocates to say, uh, look, we want, we want a, a tapestry of farms that are as, uh, as diverse as a healthy ecosystem is. And so, um, you know, I'd encourage everybody here to, I think that's another thing part of being part of a CSA is the closer you are to a farm, the more you realize that as, you know, Wendell Berry said, eating is an agricultural act. And so you are part of agriculture and you have the opportunity also to, even if you're not a farmer, call up your representative, especially those of you in cities, right? Because cities are where the, the people are and therefore that's where the power is. There's so many lawmakers in urban areas who can think that agriculture, that's not my issue, right? My issue is housing, my issue is transportation. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawmaker in Brooklyn or uh, Seattle and agriculture really isn't my thing. My constituents don't really care about that. But the truth is we all care about it and we should care about it because it affects us and it affects how we manage our land. It, it, it matters how our climate is impacted and of course our food system. So we're all connected, um, but it, it means that being part of a CSA is being part of that farm, but it also means recognizing you're part of that larger food system. So calling up your representative and saying, hey, um, you know, here's a bill. It's uh, designed for farmers, but I think that that you, as a, as a lawmaker representing urban people, should also be advocating and getting behind this with your endorsement and saying uh, we're with you and uh, we want a, bet a better, more diverse uh, food system. Thanks, Evan. And one thing I've learned in the past is read carefully. You know, I think a lot of those are presented. Um, in a way that is a little confusing. And then when you read deeper, oh, this is serving very large farms that we're calling family farms. <laughs> and, you know, to kind of pay attention to the nuance and the, and the details in that policy and those bills. And I wholeheartedly agree that if you're in an urban area, that's huge. Even where I am, I'm just outside the county of this very small town, but I live where all the farms are. So I'm always, the, and sometimes I don't get to vote on things that they get to vote on. And so, I think pay, paying close attention is super important. Um, in, in the recent months or maybe years, there's been a, a little bit of a resistance to the idea of vote with your fork. And the, the resistance is no vote with your vote. <laughs> you know, Go find the policy, understand it, read it, and then vote. <laughs> and also eat the things that you wanna see more of. But um, Tess, I'm curious for you, how does it work that, um, or how, you know, how does it work to be able to offer or increase access to some members of your community who can't buy into the model at the, at the get-go? And how can community members that can support that kind of work? You know, a stronger community, like as a whole, is a stronger community. So how does, how does your, how does fair share play into that? Yeah, I think um, going back to the vote with your fork idea, I think that's a great idea, but that's just not not everyone can do that. And so that puts the burden on the consumer to change the food system when a lot of consumers can't. Um, so um, we have a program called Partner Shares, and it's a sliding scale model where you can buy into a CSA, and then we provide a certain percentage of that um, waived. So you can buy into a CSA, you get a share, but it's not the full price, but the farmer is still getting um, the in investment of a CSA. Um, so I think it's important to, there's a balance between 
making food accessible to people, right? So being able to buy a CSA share without assuming the farmer take on that risk of, oh, I'm gonna provide discounted shares because farmers, especially small farmers, they have a really slim profit margin. And so there's a fine balance between providing accessible food and also making sure that these farms are profitable and making sure that they're able to stick around for a long time. And so that's where um, programs like partner shares come in where someone else kind of takes over some of that, um, some of the administrative work of providing that accessibility aspect. Right. And I think there's a, you all know it, there's this idea that farming is this romantic, wonderful thing and you're outside all day and isn't it wonderful, but it's some of the hardest work I've ever done or ever seen done. Um, and that is, you know, Tess, I think I, working in marketing and like, every time I've worked with farmers, they're like, I don't have time to think about this. I don't have the money to put into this. Like, you want to make a video? Like, I can't. I don't even know where to begin with this. So I think that there's this really important thing that happens, you know, in all of your organizations or businesses that you get to show people, you know, this is a really hard job. It took a really long time to learn how to do this. This is skilled. This is a skilled task. Um, and that maybe some of the skills that Fair Share or CAF can offer are outside of the farming skill set, which is, um, you know, what I want to comment on is the importance of coalition building, of working together. I think it seems to me that there is no successful, you know, small farm model that doesn't have farmers and other stakeholders in that world working together. Um, in, in a community, whether it's pushing for policy or exposing people to agriculture and farming or explaining why it's wonderful. Um, and aside from that, I mean, I think, Kat, you mentioned something um, about pride. I'm sorry, maybe that was somebody else in this circle, but, you know, I think that at Glenwood, you guys have sort of this hub of like, this is who we are in this place. You know, I think that it, without taking ownership of it, there are animals, there are, and I, I noticed in one of your videos that a farmer mentioned that joining your incubator program was essentially the thing that allowed her to stay in business or and enabled that. Um, so maybe just as a, as a final comment from all of you, like, do you agree that that's important that we have to work together in order to make this work so that to work against the, you know, 500 acre monocrop farms or, you know, not against, not to be so negative, but to kind of push forward what you're doing and why it's important and for people to understand that, how can we work together? Um, and Tess, I appreciate that mention of like, it puts a lot of the responsibility on the consumer, but what as a consumer should I pay attention to? Should I, should I focus on or do in support of my local food system? What can I do essentially? Um, and I want to be sensitive to your time. So I'm going to offer up that question to all of you. Um, I'll go because that's what I do to start it to make it just move forward on Zoom calls. Now that I have good, good rural internet, I'm going to use up all my satellite time on this. Um, but okay, so two things. One, like <laughs> I bet 500 acres is a lot of fruit. 500 acres is like a kind of regular size dairy farm. That's like a hundred cow dairy where we live. Um, so I would, I would, I would caution that division and especially where I am, um, my local community and my dairy producing conventional dairy community is what allows me to farm in the way I do. We have a co-op. I can have lime spread five minutes from my house. Propane is a co-op expense. And that's as a farm, I benefit greatly from having other farmers on the land, right? There's a level of consolidation and a dairy crisis, which are deeply problematic, mostly driven by cheese processors, not by farmers. <laughs> um, so even my farming neighbors that are milking 600 cows, they have been pushed really hard to do that. So I just want to embed that in there. Um, and they keep the public school open for my kids and they make, you know, our tax base good. Um, but in terms of cooperation. I mean, we're part of Fair Share CSO, CSA coalition. In the upper Midwest, I think, and probably similarly, I'm assuming in the Hudson Valley, the CSA community is supportive, transparent. Most of us operate on a listserv, which is like 
where we can encourage each other and fall back on information and everyone shares things openly. Um, there is, there really is no feeling of competition, even with my neighbors that are directly next to me. Um, so we, we don't feel that pressure here. We really feel like we're in it together. And there is this, especially in the organic community here, this mutually beneficial, diverse um, feeling. Um, and that's really important from a farming standpoint. And then um, I'm going to put in a plug, like people should join and follow farm organizations. National Sustainable Ag uh, Coalition is wonderful. This is my sweatshirt from the Wisconsin Farmers Union. Oh, yes, that says the original FU. That's their actual logo. How urban and trendy is that? Um, but the Wisconsin Farmers Union is a very progressive organization. The Farmers Union is at our, at our level. And so finding organizations that coalition between CSA farms and conventional dairy farms um, is also really important for changing policy so that more people can stay in farming and really craft the future. And so there's all of my caveats with community, but someone else can talk about their next thing. Yeah, Kat, yeah. Kat I just wanted to follow up on that. I just thought that um, it, it, was, it, it was a good point you made about um, consolidation and, and that it's not always necessarily about the massive farms necessarily, but about those processors and, and middle middlemen, right? It's um, when you look at who controls the food system, it's it's not so much that there are these, you know, four giant farms controlling everything. It's it's usually the four giant meat processing companies. It's it's the it's the producers of the world. It's the um, Smithfields of the world. It's the seed companies that that own 80% of corn seed. Um, and so I think for that for that reason, when we're talking about the the uh, the bottlenecks of processing, of distribution, of retail, um, that's I think where the opportunity for collaboration comes in for small farms is small farms working together to create market outlets to um, not you know and I think there is this mythology around like the individual farmer pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and just going it alone, um, and and while I think there there is something to be said for for small smallholder farmers uh, you know growing and managing. Uh, you know, individual parcels, I think that when it comes to distribution and sales and marketing and processing, I think that's where the opportunity is for that collaboration. And so we're starting to see that a lot more here in California is um, farms working together to create aggregated CSAs where there's a community of farmers um, that are all cooperatively owning. We have one right here in Sonoma County, an aggregated CSA that all farmers uh, collectively own, farmer and, and worker owned um, food cooperative that then uh, set, sends out um, CSA boxes and allows for that diversity of product, those different microclimates to work together. Um, and also recognizes that, we're, that when you're going up against Safeway uh, and Whole Foods and slash Amazon, um, you know, you're 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 much stronger as a community even even when you get all those small farms together you're still a drop in the bucket compared to uh whole foods right or, or safeway but it's uh it's that i think that's where the opportunity is to to work together to to reclaim the avenues of, of distribution sales and and processing so i'll i'll chime in here um as someone who's frequently working with and talking to both CSA members and the general public who are purchasing um, this local local products of whatever kind um, in a retail fashion. Um, Evan and Kat, you both made great points and we can and maybe should have a whole other webinar about the dairy industry and the challenges of existing in rural America in general. Um, and yes, individual farms can, can all benefit from kind of that cooperative system of just existing in the same place. Um, but I think that to kind of come back to the main focus of this specific webinar, one of the biggest ways that we are going to make that progress in furthering beneficial changes to the food system as a whole is to engage the community and the supporters and the stakeholders to illustrate what it can look like and how folks can access fresh local food because the, those products do exist. A lot of us are growing them, but a lot of people just don't know. I'm sure there are even folks on this webinar, you know, that's why we talked about what a CSA is early on. There are a lot of people who just don't know. And until we get the word out more, and I'm not saying that I have the answer on how to do that, but until folks know, they don't know and you can't you can they can't support what they don't know about so i think there's still a lot that can be done not necessarily just from the farmers because farmers are very busy um they have to grow stuff and i think that farming is one of those few few instances where someone is in a really unfortunate position of having to you know literally grow this product and then try to market it and keep themselves in business and educate all at once so i think that we have to 
engage our engage the community that already exists and engage those stakeholders who are already working for us to help engage more folks to bring more and more people into this to spread the word and you know keep us keep us in business and support a better food system thanks trixie the more you know you know it's like i think that's exactly right and especially like i don't live in a dairy area i don't know you know what that looks like and so um maybe we can leave all of you with like just you know figure out what's happening in your area what's going well what's not working where can you plug in and learn more and get involved and get engaged whether it's policy or a csa or any other you know or supporting you know access to those csas for other people in your community um i think we all have to keep learning and we're working against like buzzy headlines and big swinging documentaries and like the ideas out there are many fold and they can be really confusing. Um, but I would say once we, when we look at our own local or regional food system, that is where the, the best information and sort of engagement lives. So I'm gonna encourage everybody out there to get engaged and learn more about what your local food system is doing. Um, and and I want to open it up to any of you that have a sort of closing comment. Otherwise, I will let you go with that. Um, thank you so much for your time and insight. Um, I encourage everybody. I put links in for all of the websites that these folks are um, for businesses and organizations that they're involved in. So I encourage you to, to learn more, get involved if they're in your area, get into a CSA, <laughs> leave this webinar, go sign up for a CSA or whatever it is. Um, Thanks to all five of you so much for your time for all, for this whole month to be able to like showcase what, to, what what's working and what we should be paying attention to is really, really great for slow food. Um, a big part of what slow food is trying to do is just to let people know what's out there um, and how we can be part of a, of a better system um, that does exist, but might need a little more support and engagement from the folks around us. So unmute yourself if you have anything else you'd like to add otherwise thank you so much thanks so much for having us <laughs>